let us talk about normativity of communication. As we uh, pointed out earlier that sharing is an important aspect of communication. So, both the teacher and the student or the speaker or the hearer, they try to share certain ideas, certain thoughts, feeling, experiences. So, sharing is an important aspect of human communication. Now, this notion of sharing has three different aspects, the psychological aspect, the logical aspect and the normative aspects. I would emphasize on the normative aspect of human communication or sharing, but there are psychological and logical aspects as well. So, here I quote uh, Pradhan saying that communication is a spontaneous outburst of ideas and experiences which need to be shared intends to go out of himself and communicates with his audience real or imaginary. So, it shows that it is kind of a spontaneous urge to communicate. So, human beings have not only ideas and thoughts and experiences. So, there is an urge to communicate. So, it makes us intrinsically a communicative being. Now, this urge is not just a psychological urge, but there is also a logical aspect to this. The logical aspect will show that how there is a difference between the I, the speaker and the hearer. How does I recognize myself as a speaker? How does I recognize this very fact that I am speaking to somebody else? I am somebody would else would respond to it, somebody else will understand it. So, when I say something, I solicit the response of the hearer. Now, this whole idea of soliciting a response involves two important concepts, the self on the one hand and the other on the other hand. The self and the other are two distinct individuals or I and you are two distinct individuals. And in the case of a normative communication, we try to show that how certain values if inculcated in the framework of communicative intentionality, then they succeed in bridging the gap between the self and the other, the speaker and the hearer, the, address, the addresser and the addressees. So, therefore, it has a logical component as well, because it treats two individuals as distinct individuals and then try to show that how they are normatively bound. So, so communication has psychological, logical and normative aspect and as we have mentioned that it is, it is a normative way of communicating uh, to the other is to be appreciated here and why it is to be appreciated here. Because when we communicate something to the other, there is a deep personal involvement we talk about and something which is uniquely personal. And I make an appeal by saying something to you, I make an appeal to you. So, that is how it, I solicit your response and, and by saying this, I uniquely identify me as a particular individual and this individual is appealing to the hearer and the hearer must respond to that. So, so the, it is in this context, our individual personal identity has been very creatively thought out as a normative engagement and that would put both hearer and the speaker in one platform and that would construe uh, or that would uh, show that how moral identity is built up. Now, it is in this context, we also need to uh, take into account what is the notion of understanding, where does understanding uh, emerge as a kind of an outcome of this whole process of communication. So, communication is complete when the addressee or the hearer grasps the content of what has been said to him. This grasping is a indeed cognitive act. I understand what has been said to me, but it is not just merely cognitive. If the hearer is not competent, then certainly um, the communication will fail, but that is not the uh, point I am emphasizing here. I am emphasizing here that communication would can be incomplete. Um, 
I am emphasizing here that communication could be incomplete, could be a failure due to various reason. Competency is one reason, but there are many competing speaker and hearer, still communication fails. Say for example, when uh, we talk about the communication between the teacher and the listener, communication between two political agents, communication uh, that is happening among the intellectuals. Um, so, in, in these cases, we talk about that how we need to place these two individuals in a normative framework and in one platform where their activities are normatively conditioned. And that we talk about communication is intersubjective or interpersonal as we have been uh, talking about. This intersubjectivity is nothing but shows or highlights how we are committed to what we say and what kind of obligations the speaker or the hearer um, inculcate in their uh, framework of uh, communication. What kind of obligation or commitment the speaker and the hearer um, have when they communicate and uh, respond to the other. So, so it is not just merely a communication is a self interested activities. The self interest does not really follow from uh, being rational. It could as it has been articulated by Kant um, and Kant's and deontology says that we are all rational being and thereby our rationality is the source of uh, obligation and commitment. But I would rather go further and many of the communications theorists like Bloom, Pradhan and many others have tried to go beyond this framework taking clue from Kant's, but not certainly limited by the utilitarian way of approaching to the problem. Because that will make whole exercise a cognitive one, rather the primacy is given here to the ethical. The ethical is given uh, primacy precisely because it brackets out the authority, the power that the speaker has. So, for example, when a teacher is communicating to the student, now teacher uh, being an authority, being a knower, when he or she tries to explain uh, certain things to the uh, student, the, they have certain power, they have certain authority. This power and authority may result in violence, that is what may cause a failure of communication. That may be a reason of the failure of communication in the normative uh, framework of human communication. So, the communicative intentionality must essentially normatively self reflective. It must be essentially normatively self reflective, that is what I uh, emphasize because that will help us to overcome our ego or the natural self that embodies power and authority. This can happen if we try to articulate a cooperation and trust in this way, the way the Martin Buber says that how do I see my relationship with the other, how does the self articulates its relationship with the other. Is it an I it relationship or is it an I thou relationship? Buber emphasizes that that I thou relationship is a normative relationship where he says a inward necessity to think about the axis of human existence to authentically carry out a dialogue or conversation. Now, if I need to authentically carry out a conversation and share my ideas, share my thoughts and share what I believe is true, then I must not articulate this whole conversation in a I eat mode. So, the I eat relationship is a mode of relationship where the subject or the self does not enter entirely into the realm of a normative framework of human communication. Rather, the, the self retains its ego, retains its power and therefore, Buber says that it, 
it is not an authentic dialogue that the speaker intends to carry out. An authentic dialogue must recover our communication, must make the communication live and transformative. It must bring an appropriate change in the world. So, so therefore, when we say something and we would like to say in such a way that our communication or our expression has to be effective, it must bring some change, a desirable change in the world. And this desirable change has to be transformative. So, it is in this context, Gosberg points out, uh, referring to Levinas and uh, Buber, that our communication is uh, not only interpersonal and intersubjective, rather understanding is intersubjective. When communication becomes intersubjective and understanding then is defined as intersubjective. So, the individuality of the speaker enters into a different realm of communications, where the, there is no gap between the subject and the object. There is no gap between the speaker and the hearer. So, they are tied up, they are unified in, in a one particular framework and that framework constitutes a kind of a we relation. Okay. So, understanding maintains that we relation or it is a desirable that understanding ought to maintain a we relation when we talk about communication or human communication in particular. So, therefore, Gos Gosberg writes, I quote, understanding is an emergent product of interaction among subjects located within a constantly articulated system of intersubjective relation and meanings. So, this is how understanding is um, intersubjective, because understanding emerges out of this intentional normative uh, bond that has been created within a normative framework of communication. Thank you.